the leper scholar versus Jesus, chapter 53, verse 2. For he has grown by his favor like a tree crown, like a tree trunk out of arid ground. He had no form or beauty that we should look at him, no charm that we should find him pleasing. This is another reference to the righteous servant initially being repulsive to the Jewish people, though finally accepted by many and then a multitude of them, those that are made righteous. Those who are his witnesses, who can believe our report, who can believe what we have heard. In Isaiah 52, 13, through 15. He's described as so marred in his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. But even so, he startles many nations, and kings are silenced by him, and he is exalted and raised to great heights. So here in verse 2, it says he had no form of beauty. In verse 14, his appearance is so more beyond human semblance. It's one of two things. He's been afflicted by God in these verses. And affliction can be disease. You can be afflicted by God with disfigurement at birth. King David would have nothing to do with the blind, the lame, <clears throat> the crippled. You know, unlike Jesus. <clears throat> Because the belief in those days was that God did not like these people. And so they, he didn't want to be around people that God didn't like. So he just had nothing to do with them. Or it can be, as, as I'll point out in just a moment, that it's because the man's a Gentile. And the last thing in the world the Jewish people are expecting from their Moshiach of chapter 11, who's described in chapter 53, according to the sages in the Talmud, uh, although uh, Rashi, many years after the Talmud was completed, decided that uh, he had a different idea. Well, he was wrong. It's not, it's not all of the Jewish people as the man Israel. It's not a song. As it is said, uh, which was from Bernard Down, a Christian, a, uh, a commentator on the Old Testament of the Holy Bible, which of course is the Hebrew Bible with several, uh, a few changes here and there. <clears throat> And that alone, that, that, that makes, you know, they don't, it's an extreme, more behind, beyond uh, human appearance. And it's not, unlike that of man. He just doesn't look like other people to the Jewish person. They like to look upon their own. They have a Jewish state. They like the Jewish people and they want their savior, so to speak. Their Moshe, the one who's going to bring this great exaltation and redemption and messianic era of Perfection in the world, no flaws, no faults, no sin, no pain, food for everybody, a, just ut a utopia. And it's not the only re religion to have that. They kind of all seem to end that way. I mean, uh, uh, everything's going to be wonderful for us because we're right. Well, This man grows by the favor of God like a tree crown. A dot, and again, this is continuing the symbolism of an ancestral tree. This, this stump of Jesse from chapter 11. Once again, God is using, as he has this written, as Isaiah writes this, this man grows like a tree crown. So this is the great heights because a dominant tree crown reaches over all other plants in the forest, including the crowns of other trees. This man's lifted up high. This man whose appearance is marred. He has no form or beauty. We did not find him pleasing. It all changes.
it all changes. A lot of it is just disbelief that God is actually doing what he said he was going to do, and he's doing it when he said he was going to do, unlike Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ prophesied his return by, by the measurement of lives and being. His generation, people alive when he was born. Everyone alive when Jesus is born, that's his generation. When they're all dead, his generation is over. He gathers his twelve. There are those amongst you who will see me return. You know they did. You high priest, you shall see me return. No, they didn't. You, the people of Caesarea, there are those amongst you who will be alive when I return. No, they weren't. <laughs> They're all dead. My favorite, the book of Revelation. Speaking through an angel to the writer of the Revelation, those, this is Jesus, those who pierce me with the spear shall see me return. No, they didn't. There's, that's, there's five of them. There's, that's five false prophecies. The other is his generation. He, he, his prediction of his return with all this calamity in the world. There's a, a chapter that's got like 52 verses. He tells his, he gathers his, his, his 12 or some of them, and he's telling them all this. This is going to happen. The temple's going to be destroyed. Um, on and on. And those are the things that Christians look for, for his return. Which, as I said, he used lies in being, and he uses it in that chapter. The last verse says, My generation shall not pass until all these things occur. Some of them actually did occur, but he didn't come back. And it wasn't all of them by any stretch of the imagination. False prophecy, false God. And what else did he say? Last page of the Revelation, three times. I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. Three different verses, that's what he's saying. Why? Because he knew he hadn't done what the Moshe is supposed to do, which is defeat Rome. I believe he felt he had to die, become God, come back, and then he could defeat Rome. Because on the cross, he found out he was wrong about everything. This man of Isaiah 53, as he proclaimed that his own Christianity believes today. The belief that Isaiah 53 says a man is crucified and by his blood we are saved and sinless and go to heaven. This isn't in Isaiah 53. The man's given long life and makes him any righteous by his knowledge. If the arid ground is in a Christian country and his form was a Gentile, under the Jewish law, the Halakha, would he be attractive and pleasing to the Jewish people? Not at all. But if he comes from a Christian country with God to Israel and converts Orthodox Judaism and becomes an Israeli citizen, the many who become a multitude made righteous will most likely look favorably upon him. And I think they will. Verse 3. He was despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with disease. As one who hid his face from us, he was despised. We held him of no account. He will be despised and shunned and held no account simply for declaring that he is the Lord's righteous servant, described in Isaiah 53, particularly being a Gentile and from an arid land. Christianity with God's wrath passed to them in Isaiah 51. And the rabbis reckoned with and dismissed. And of course, God is using his righteous servant for that purpose in the day of the Lord. 
It's part of the day of the Lord. It's his vindication, his revenge. Where that fits into the Messianic era, I don't know. You know, that whole, it's selective. It's selective. Well, we like this. We, we, we like it that a, a man of 100 years is going to be but a child. We like everybody to be perfect. We like everybody to uh, destroy their weapons and um, come and take care of us with the money they had. You know, it was break down our plow uh, their swords into plowshares and till the ground for the Jews. Well, how about we come deliver atomic bombs? How about Russia? They got quite a bit of them. You want to come and break them down into plowshares? Sure, it's a metaphor. You really think the people of our land are going to come and take care of you? It's selective because you leave so much out. Where's the day of the Lord? Where's his vengeance? Where's his wrath on Christianity? You, you, you say that... I, as Moshiach, am going to go and convince two billion Christians that the Jews have been right all along and that there is no Jesus. and never was. And no, no one died for their sins. They're going to be responsible for their sins. Now that isn't what you think, is it? You think God's going to come down and change the minds of every human being on this planet. for you because you suffered. Well, he's making a heaven just for you. And if anybody wants to be a part of that heaven, including the Christians, the Islamists, Buddhists, anyone and everyone with a different false god, they're going to have to convert to Judaism and become a Jew. And that includes your Moaites, Noahites, or Ides. Noahites. <laughs> you know, they want to and your Messianic Judaism folk. You know, if you want to practice Judaism, be a Jew. It's that simple. Because God is building a heaven with the name Israel endures. He flat out says it. it's just for them. That's your reward. You're not getting a Messianic era. Those are verses just for the people of antiquity and illiterate ignorant society that love like children who love to be told stories the bigger the story the better and the story of jesus i'm quite sure was one of the most popular stories a story that started a hundred years before his birth if you look at where the symbolism comes from the Essenes, the writers of the dead sea scrolls their founder his very name is the teacher of righteousness. Just as Jesus is thought of the man of Isaiah 53. They had their own gate at Jerusalem. And they had it all the way to the destruction of the second temple in year 70 common era. You think they didn't hear this story about Jesus? Nobody ever wrote a single word about him until 40 years after his death. The Gospel of Mark, 40 years after, and what was happening then. And so that story had been going on for 170 years. It's a great story. It's got all kinds of miracles and walking on water and raising dead. Things that people of that time, they just like believed in those kind of things. Resurrection of the Dead, we all love zombie movies. You can just turn on the TV and get one, so we must love them. I've watched many of them. But I don't believe you can raise dust if there's even dust left of the Israelites who were slaves in Egypt. And yet, that's what Rambam says is going to happen. Every single Jew who has ever lived will rise up. What about the evil bad ones? Do they get risen up? I never saw an exception to it. What about the rabbis dismissed? Do, do, are you part of the Messianic era? Do you become flawless? Do you become without sin? Do you do that without God? Selective, selective. Ignore what you don't like. God's coming with utter destruction. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. A day of the Lord, who cares? It's our day. We have suffered. And heaven's not in eternal life. Not enough for us. We want more. We want it on earth first. Then we want it in heaven. 
Oh, that's right. After the Messianic era comes the world to come, and now you have described heaven on and earth. What happened to uh, Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10? Sure, he's got chapter 37 where God takes him to the field of bones and tells Ezekiel, command the bones to rise. Rise, old bones, rise. And out of nowhere, flesh and muscle and internal organs start flying to these bones and they become the resurrected human being. And their souls are in the realm of souls who notice that their new body has appeared and they go and reconnect with it. Is that the same old soul you used to have? Or did God purify it in the realm of what? I hadn't read any of this in the scripture. This is what Judaism teaches. And God is livid about it. Livid. Because we are in the age of reason, enlightenment, knowledge, science, medicine. We're supposed, we're supposed to know what these poor people who had to live in that time didn't know. Some things just can't happen. That's why the rabbis reckon with and dismiss shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. You have just heard it. Who am I? Rabbis, because you're going to have to recognize me. You're going to have to recognize these teachings. You're going to have to recognize the two books that God had me taught. You're going to have to recognize it and take it to your flock. You're going to have to straighten out your errors in interpretation and teaching to get back in right standing with him. And he can use you. He can use all your followers. He can use the new teaching being more relevant to the real world for the young people to come back to Judaism. Part of Elijah's job. Part of the job of the righteous servant of God. He does want you. But <laughs> this is God we're talking about. He's not, he's, he's not going to make it easy on you. You, he, you know, he never leaves the Jews. He never has. Even though he says, even your spokesperson broke my covenant. That would be Moses. <laughs> he says, you all broke it. But I married you anyway. The Christians say in that very verse right there, there's another in the book of Hebrews, another deceitful act on the part of the Christians. The writer of that book says right there, he's talking about the new covenant. And he's instead of, and he espoused them, he says, and he abandoned them. They just change it. You know, it's, you know, with the deceits of Jesus, on, on, on the prophecy and what the prophet said about him entering Jerusalem for what they call the Last Supper, where he's supposed to def not only defeat Rome, but be anointed king from sea to sea and from ocean to land's end. I think they're describing the entirety of the world with that. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what the scripture says. It's got nothing to do with being crucified. Nothing. All the prophets say of me, and yet not one did. And then you got this kind of see. God left you. Paul did the same thing. God left you because you sinned. He came to us. He came to us, but he's forgiven our sins. Well, we can keep sinning. Do you know, God took me when he's teaching me in the New Testament to one of the mega churches here with Joel Osteen. It's a great place to go on a hot summer. I'll tell you that. They got great air conditioning. But uh, this guy, this uh, leader of the church came up to me and said, uh, you know, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are forgiven of every sin you have ever committed. And here's what you don't know. You're forgiven of every sin you're still going to do. Because Jesus knows you're going to do it. Well, thanks for the carte blanche. <laughs> Go do whatever you want. <laughs> So I don't have to quit sinning at all. You know, because I'm a sinner, and yeah. You know. <laughs> and this is the person who believes God performs human sacrifice for him. Okay. You know, remember, I was an atheist for 50 years. I hear things like this, and I just, you know, what are you, what, what, what is this? 
Oh, and I'm in the world. I'm a lawyer. I've, I've seen all kinds of people. I've represented all kinds of people. But until I really got amongst the religious Christians, and God made me, <laughs> He made me watch every Christian channel there is until I knew everybody. <laughs> I'm like, hey, yeah, can we watch a thriller or a mystery or something? So anyway, I'm going to carry on. Um, Gentiles will despise and shun the man who startles the nations and silences their leaders for announcing that he is the anointed one the Jewish people had been waiting for and that Jesus cannot possibly be the man described in Isaiah 53. The Jewish people will despise and shun me for the reason they expect and have been taught that the anointed one is Jewish, not a Gentile. In the era of exaltation, redemption, and restoration of the Messianic era, they had been taught will not be occurring. It is the nature of people to reject, despise, and hold of no account a man who has no visible proof to substantiate his claims that God speaks to him as God spoke to Moses, that he is a man prophesied to come in the Hebrew Bible, that he is a messenger and deliverer of covenants of God, and that the Spirit of the Holy God has alighted upon him. I have but the one truth I mentioned in verse 1. I offered myself to guilt. I was supposed to be dead within a month or so, 20 years ago, and I had no... Lung cancer doesn't disappear. <laughs> Lung cancer, they said they couldn't even treat. And I have absolutely no sense of now I haven't been x-rayed again, but God tells me it's just simply not there. You saw those white spots. If you did have an x-ray, you wouldn't see them today. And it doesn't matter to me. I don't have any symptoms. I'm doing just fine. And I've got long life, and I can already tell. See, he won't tell me the future. I'm not a prophet of the future. I'm not a seer. No man is. No man can see the future. God knows and can make prophecy because of his absolute knowledge of all things. He can think things through and go, okay, then this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. He knew when he wrote, had Malachi write the day of the Lord, that the Internet was going to be here. Because he needs it to get this message for the Jews, for their redemption. For the Jews to stand up and go, see, who he told you. It's the leper scholar. Just like our sages said. And he, he's telling the Christians why we don't believe in it. And God is going to build his temple again. And the scripture said that means he sanctifies Israel and us, the Jewish people. In my opinion, this is better than the Messianic age. Because does a Jew really want the world to be a Jew? Because I know you feel special about it. God took me to a conservative synagogue. Uh, the largest one in uh, the largest conservative synagogue in the world that's here in Houston, and um, I went to the high hall. I went to the conversion class. Uh, now he's already told me you're going to convert Orthodox in Israel, but he had me going to the synagogue, and I went to the conversion classes uh, for a while, and I did go through all the uh, high holidays. I loved it. I loved the people. They were so kind and nice to me and uh, learned so much, went through the Yom Kippur services, everything. And of course, God's with me the whole time. <laughs> That's what's so nice. Plus, his power's on me. If I got a little bored, he can make me just tranquil and patient. <laughs> and he's good about that. Uh, when we're really working and it's not, he's not working me over, so to speak. But, uh, I, I mean, I found out they, they, you're, the Jewish people are very proud of being a Jew. And uh, do you want everybody in the world just like you? How about this? How about 98% of the world would be Jews who converted to 2% of the naturally born Halakha Jew? How do you like those numbers? To me, I, start, <laughs> I might even worry a little bit. 
You know why? Because they're going to take over, you know, because you all negotiate on how you're going to run your synagogue, how you're going to run your your services, and uh, all of a sudden it's 98 to 2 every time you open your mouth. They wouldn't want that. This is so much better. And it's real. It's real. And it's something your, your children can understand. You know, this is the reality of it. And he is here. You tell your children that, and they're going to come back to Judaism. They're going to leave. If they, if they believe in Jesus or trying to mix it with Judaism, you show them these videos and you say, that's God working. This is what he does. He comes and gets a man just like Moses. That's what he does. And he gave us a description. And by his knowledge that he's revealing, we know it must be him. Moses said, who am I? I said the same thing. Who am I to go listen to me, a Gentile from Texas? Moses said, who am I? And God said, tell them my name. <laughs> Moses said, what did they ask me what it is? Tell them I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, mind you, this is 400 years after the Jacob clan left for, for Egypt. Do you mean, do they even really know? I saw one video, somebody said there was one old woman who had heard that before. And she said, it must be him. And God gave him three uh, uh, miracles, which could have been just tricks. He did give him the, the staff that turns into a snake. He, gave, he told Moses, put your hand in your shirt. Pull it out. Leprosy. Put it back in. Pull it out. Gone. Remove leprosy, just like he can remove cancer, apparently. In other words, I got one of the same miracles. And then take a drop of water from the Nile and drop it down. I think it says in the sand, and it shall turn to blood. That's it. And he had Aaron with him to try to back him up. I don't have anybody. I've always been kind of a loner. I got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> My best friend. We're, we're friends. <clears throat> um, anyway Jesus a man of suffering this is what's being described here, you know in this verse a man of suffering for me with disease Jesus wept one time. This is the shortest verse in the Christian New Testament. Jesus wept. That's it. Jesus wept. Why? Because he was, because he had just raised his friend Lazarus, who had been dead four days. You know, Jesus was dead three days, and he rose. Lazarus had been dead four because Jesus was late getting there. And <laughs> but he, but, but he wept because still nobody believed who he was. Which I suppose means, and I see I've heard them talking about this, uh, that, that he was the man of Isaiah 53. Or, be, right, or because of the miracles he was performing, he was God. Uh, he does indicate that in many a verse. I am God. But uh, I, I don't think he ever actually just says it like that. It's, it's just implied. But in any event, that's, that's not a life of suffering. And as far as wounded, and all you have is he got whipped, and he got nailed to a cross, and at the end of nine hours, he yelled to God, why would you forsake me? And then he, quote, gave up the ghost. He didn't even die, apparently. He just let his spirit go without him. <laughs> I guarantee you, there's many. If God had given us that power, people would be dropping all over the place. I can't take it anymore. I'd rather be dead. Boom! There goes your spirit, which is the ghost. He gave up his ghost. He quit trying. And you're talking to a man who laid in the back of an ambulance for eight hours, gut shot, hanging on with everything I had. The only thought in my mind was, you have got to hurt me. And I was still saying it in the shock room of Ben Taub Hospital. You have got to hurry. But anyway, I pulled through. And went on to run track that year. <laughs> And I got shot October 5, 1975, and uh, in early February, I, I won a high hurdles race in a comp very competitive district in Houston. And then, 
It was tough getting back, but I, I enjoyed the struggle. <laughs> the suffering of trying to achieve, which it's that suffering of the Jewish people that makes you so successful, is what God tells me, and I believe it. I've learned a lot about suffering with God, and I've learned an awful lot about the suffering of the Jewish people. <clears throat> that's basically the whole, that, that's my world. It's the Jewish people, the history, uh, their lives, their daily lives, their lives as they were, the Middle East, Iran, the terrorist organization, his Baal, all these, you know, Lebanon and everything else. Um, he's taught me well, taught me well. He hid his his face from us. I'm reading from my uh, from a midrash, my midrash on 53. That's in um, Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord. Who hid his face from us? In other words, I'm taking sections of the verse and explaining each one of them. He was despised; we held him of no account. Okay, well, a man who is despised and held of no account is not going to go out among the people. You know, until the perception of, his, of him changes, and he's asked to, which hopefully my books are going to do for him. People are going to say, this, he, didn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't know these things. There is a proof. We're the Jews. We've been expecting him. We believe God will do what he says he's going to do. But uh, at least in social media, I, I've been kicked out of many a group just for suggesting Isaiah 53 might be Isaiah. I mean, Elijah. I didn't even bother saying, well, what if he's a Gentile? <laughs> it might come after me. I don't know. You can't talk about it. It's there. Tokyo Singer says, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> just what he's just meant. I didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Okay, this is certainly not Jesus. He never hit his face. He's outside. Legions of followers. He was never confined to his home like Ezekiel and me in this room. <laughs> I got taken from society just like Ezekiel. You're not going out with anybody anymore. No friends, no nothing. Uh, just me. God says, just me and my, my spirit. Whew. It's been a long 13 years. <laughs> um, Yeah, Jesus, he was never despised. He was always held in high esteem. Sure, some of the, the religious leaders had it in for him. They didn't like what he was saying. And they could tell he wasn't going to be the Messiah, Moshiach, that he was supposed to be Messiah, that he wasn't going to be the answer to the, the Roman occupation. Uh, but that, wouldn't, that, that wasn't the general population. Okay, well, that ends verse 3. And I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I'll pick up verse 4. Um, <laughs> apparently this afternoon. Thank you.